So in last week's reading, the religious authorities challenged Jesus and asked him a question which he refused to answer. So from verse 9 we read on. He went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, rented it to some farmers and went away for a long time. At harvest time he sent a servant to the tenants so they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant, but that one also they beat and treated shamefully and sent away empty-handed. He sent still a third and they wounded him and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my son whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, God forbid! Jesus looked directly at them and asked, Then what is the meaning of that which is written, The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. But they were afraid of the people. Thanks. It's great to have had that passage read. Um, do please keep it open um, in front of you. Uh, it's on page um, 1054, um, Luke chapter 20, uh, verses 9 to 19. We're going to be thinking about it for the next few minutes. Before we do that, though, let me lead us in a prayer. Let's bow our heads and I'll pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us to hear from you and respond in the way that we should. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The story that we've just had read to us has a big theme about change, a significant change that occurs in it. So I just wanted to spend the first minute or so thinking a little bit about change. Some of us love change, don't we? We love new opportunities, new challenges, new adventures. Others of us love routine, uh, things staying pretty much the same. If you're a person like me, you're a bit of a creature of habit. You wouldn't mind too much if you had the same thing for breakfast every single day. But whether we love change or, or whether we find it hard, most of us find it hard to come to terms with very significant or very radical change. And so over the past couple of months with the coronavirus, just think back to March when we were first told about the drastic change most of us would have to make to our lifestyles. It took a lot of coming to terms with, didn't it? Well, in today's passage, we hear about a change that is so radical that the people listening to Jesus are shocked. But rather than backing away from what he says, he reinforces it and goes on to talk about a change that will come later, which will be even more final. I was listening to the radio this week. I heard the Chancellor talking about what's to come. And he was saying about how What's happening at the moment, the economic effects are going to cause long term scarring to our economy, that there's unlikely to be any quick bounce back. And the sobering news of today's passage, I've tried to summarise in a sentence, very difficult and very sobering news. And that is that those who don't bear fruit for God's son will be broken and crushed. 
those who don't bear fruit for God's Son, will be broken and crushed. We heard from the story, didn't we, that it's a story that Jesus told 2,000 years ago uh, in Jerusalem. And we see in verse 9 that he went on to tell the people this parable. So it's a story he's telling to the people. And at the end of the story in verse 19, that the teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. So it's a story directed at the leadership in Jerusalem. And how did they know that it was directed at them? Well, it's because Jesus in this story talks about a vineyard, which would have been well understood as a picture that God had used in the Old Testament to describe his people in his place under his rule and blessing. The Bible story starts with God making a perfect world, but humanity uh, rebelling against God uh, and the result being sin and death entering the world. God responds by putting uh, humanity under his condemnation and the earth under a curse. But that's not the whole story, because right from the beginning of the Bible, God promises to remake a broken world. In Genesis 12, he promises blessing to Abraham and his offspring, and he promises to bless all the world through them. And Abraham's offspring become the nation of Israel. He saves Israel from slavery. He gives them his laws. They become his people. Where humanity continues in ignorance and rebellion against God, Israel are to be his people, his vineyard. Many of us might associate vineyards with um, holiday times, perhaps in France or Italy or somewhere like that. You'll probably have associate them with all sorts of happy things, uh, things like holidays, time off, uh, maybe sunshine like we've been having recently, um, enjoyment, the joy of having a bit of wine tasting perhaps. Uh, and it's a brilliant image uh, for what it was supposed to be, to be God's people in God's place under his rule and blessing. Uh, it was supposed to be such a place of, uh, of wonder and excitement and that God's people would re respond in joyful praise to God. They would give him glory and that blessing of being his people would overflow to all the nations. But in Jesus' story, the tenants in the vineyard refuse to give the fruit of the vineyard to the owner. And God's people fail to give him the honour and praise for all the blessings he'd given them, culminating in the rejection of his son, Jesus Christ. And that, of course, would happen just a few weeks after Jesus told this story. And therefore, you get the shocking conclusion of Jesus' story in verses 15 and 16. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to those tenants, do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. In other words, God is saying that from now on, God's vineyard, the place of his activity, the place of his people, of his rule and his blessing, will go elsewhere. It will no longer be invested in those he'd given charge of it to, the religious leaders, the chief priests, uh, in Jerusalem, the temple in Jerusalem. Those who reject his son, it will, will no longer have charge of it. It will be given to others. In other words, radical, radical change was about to come to Israel. And so when the people hear this, verse 16, they respond, God forbid. Matthew, Mark and Luke record this parable, but only Luke chooses to focus on the reaction of the crowd um, who react in this way, those who are shocked by what Jesus says, that charge of God's vineyard will be taken away from those who reject his son and given to others. And we may wonder why anyone would be shocked at this. After all, if you had a buy to let property and your tenants behaved like the people in this story, would you be as patient with them as God is patient with the tenants in this vineyard? Verse 10, the first servant, at harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty handed. I expect most of us would have the tenants evicted after verse 10, wouldn't we? And yet God's dealings with the tenants in this story are, are recklessly patient. 
They're almost irresponsibly patient, aren't they? Uh, we see in verse 11, uh, he sends another servant, but that one also they beat and treated shamefully and sent away empty handed. And then again in verse 12, he, he's patient again. He sent still a third and they wounded him and threw him out. Uh, and then it gets to verse 13. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? Perhaps I'll send my son whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. And we're thinking to ourselves, no, don't do it. Then you get what kind of people they are. Just send in the armed police and sort them out. But the thing is, some of the people listening knew what God is like. They knew that he is ridiculously patient, insanely patient almost. God describes himself in the Old Testament again and again as slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. They knew how kind God is, how quick he is to forgive. How many times, time and time again, he'd borne with his people over the centuries in the Old Testament history. So God forbid, was now really the moment when God was gonna take the charge of his vineyard, uh, that his people, his place, would move elsewhere, that they would no longer be under the leadership of Israel? And the answer is, yes, that really was going to happen. Verse 17, Jesus looked directly at them and asked, then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And verse 18, everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. Jesus here uses language from three places in the Old Testament, from Psalm 118, from Isaiah 8, and from Daniel 2. Psalm 118, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The leadership in Jerusalem would reject Jesus, but, Jesus, but God would raise him from the dead and make him the cornerstone of God's people and God's purposes in the world. From now on, God's people would be those who are built on Jesus. And then the language from Isaiah 8, everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. That is to say that everyone who fails to recognise Jesus as who he truly is, as God's son and the Christ, will be broken to pieces. That is, so long as they reject Jesus as the Christ, they will have no share in God's vineyard. They'll have no share in the joy and the privilege of being part of his people or working for him in the present age. And Daniel 2, anyone on whom it falls will be crushed, uh, which is a picture of final judgment. For those who persist uh, in not recognising Jesus as God's son and the Christ, the one to whom this world and all its fruit belongs, they will end up being crushed under his eternal condemnation. Radical, radical change. Those who don't bear fruit for God's son, Jesus is saying he will be broken. And if they still don't turn to him, in the end, they will be crushed. It's a devastating, devastating thing to say, isn't it? A devastating truth. And yet, isn't it also right? Verse 14. When the tenants saw the sun, they taught the matter over. This is the air, they said. Let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. So what does all this mean for us? Well, I've summarised the message of this passage as follows. Those who don't bear fruit for God's son will be broken and crushed. And so what's the meaning for us? Well, I think it's a warning to us. So I've summarised it this way. So beware. There but for God's grace go you and me. Those who don't bear fruit for God's son will be broken and crushed. So beware. There but for God's grace go you and me. There is one glimmer of hope for you and me in this passage. And it's in verse 16. 
he will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. If you're one of God's people here today, it's because of God's gift of his grace. Because can't we see in our own hearts the same attitude or at least an attitude which is similar to the tenants of wanting to enjoy the fruit of God's vineyard, but not give him the best of it. All of us deserve to be broken and finally crushed. And yet Jesus was broken and crushed on our, in our place on the cross so that we might live, so that we might be part of God's building project, a place built on Jesus, the cornerstone, to live for his honour and glory. And if you've come to know that wonderful gift for yourself, then I take it this passage is a warning for us not to forget it or to move away from it. Though Jesus Christ changes us when we come to him, so that we really can live for his honour. Yet we all fail to do that as we should. And yet there is no end to his grace and mercy and forgiveness for us. The one danger that we must avoid is to forget that we need his grace at all and to move away from seeing our need for Jesus Christ and to live for him. That's a danger for everyone who calls themselves a Christian, however long you've been a Christian whether you hold a position of Christian leadership, whether you're part of an institution that's been Christian for hundreds of years, or a country that perhaps does or used to call itself Christian, that danger of forgetting our need for God's grace. Maybe someone's listening today and you've never put your trust in Jesus as God's son. Can you see how outrageous it is to live in God's world without giving him any acknowledgement? just as those tenants in the story did. And can you also see the wonder of God's mercy, that he didn't just wind the whole project up, that he gave the vineyard to others, so that all who come to Christ for cleansing and forgiveness can enjoy life with built on him, the cornerstone. So this passage would warn us of our need for God's grace, but I think it would also warn us about how we view others who don't follow Jesus Christ. The thing is, after Jesus died and rose again and ascended to heaven, for a while the temple kept on standing. The chief priests and the teachers of the law in Jerusalem kept on doing their thing, and in many ways they grew in influence and power. They bore down hard on those who claimed that Jesus is the Son of God. And so Luke wrote his gospel so that his readers would be certain that Jesus really is God's son. He really is the Messiah, the fulfillment of all God's promises in the Old Testament, that Jesus really is the cornerstone and foundation, and that from now on, those who follow, those who are God's people in God's place under God's blessing, are those who are built on Jesus and that confession of Jesus as the son of God. Luke's first readers needed to be sure of this, as they suffered at the hands of those who rejected Jesus' claims to lordship. Or perhaps they were wowed by them, awed by their power and influence and status, tempted by the comforts of joining in with them. And the same is true for us today, isn't it? There are many in our world who achieve amazing, awesome things, but without any reference to Jesus as the Christ or acknowledgement of him as God's son. When we look around our amazing city of London, we see the skyscrapers in Canary Wharf and the vast wealth that some people have achieved. All the scientific, scientific and technological advances by the Googles and the Teslas of this world. All the wonderful works done by charities. The amazing wisdom and insight of some people in our society. And we can wonder, can't we, can it really be that those who seem to be so fruitful in their life if they don't acknowledge Jesus as the Son of God, then they have no part in God's blessing in the world today and face a future of condemnation. And yet that's what this passage clearly warns us. It's possible to do fruitful things. Who knows, those tenants might have actually been quite skillful vine dressers. It's possible to do things that God wants even, yet if we do them with no reference to his Son, 
Well, we're just like the rebellious tenants in Jesus' story. So let's be warned about being overawed by the power and influence of people who don't know Jesus or frightened by them or seduced by them into giving up trusting Jesus as the Son of God. Let's instead be concerned for their salvation, for that is what God is doing in our world today. God's vineyard in our world today is those who are built on Jesus Christ as the cornerstone, who are living for him and seeking to further his mission to seek and to save the lost. And in particular, this passage should make us long for and pray for the salvation of our Jewish friends and neighbours who are outside God's people so long as they don't recognise Jesus as his son, but who God wants to bring into salvation through Jesus Christ. So I've just got three quick questions that might be helpful for us to think about. Are you persuaded that judgment is coming for those who reject Jesus Christ? Secondly, why do we find it hard to believe that judgment is coming? And thirdly, how does it change our perspective on our lives? I think we're going to sing in just a minute. Um, but before that, uh, let me pray uh, as we close. Let's bow our heads and pray. Our Father in heaven, it's only by your grace that we see that our hearts naturally go astray from you and don't bear fruit for you. And only by your grace that we see we deserved your condemnation, but through Jesus Christ we be, can be forgiven and restored. May we know your grace. Please keep us in your grace, that we may beware of the end of those who don't respect your Son. Give us grace each day to be able to do your business and to acknowledge you in all we do, that we may bear fruit for you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.